This activity is a lot of fun to do, but remember to be very careful. Iron gall ink is and was in the 16th century also used as a poison. There's a high amount of iron in this final ink that you make. So you don't want to get it all over your skin and you definitely don't want to ingest it. So make sure as you're completing this activity that you're very careful with what you're making and don't take it internally. Iron gall ink is a poisonous substance. Hello and welcome. I'm Cassidy Cash and this is That Shakespeare Life, the show where we go behind the curtain and into the real life and history of William Shakespeare. This week we're taking a look at 16th century iron gall ink. This was the most popular kind of ink available in Shakespeare's lifetime and many of the surviving manuscripts we have from Shakespeare's life are written in iron gall ink. And when you had this in the 16th century, you most often made it yourself from items you went and got from an apothecary. So today we've invited Lucas Tucker from Scribal Workshop, who makes this kind of iron gall ink himself, to show us how to do it. Let's get started. Today, we are using primarily this DIY iron gall ink kit from Scrabble Workshop. Lucas mailed us one of these to give it a try. And when you open it up, the most fun thing, I think, is you're immediately greeted by this beautiful little, I don't know if you can see that. It's iron gall ink kit, and it comes with almost everything you need to make this yourself. Now, what comes in the kit are the things that's hard to get anywhere else. So you have your iron sulfate and your Aleppo oak galls and your gum Arabic powder. These things are your technical things and that's what comes in the kit and they're perfectly sized to be exactly what you need to make this for yourself at home. It also comes with your wooden spoon and your gloves that you're, that you're going to need, I assume. Lucas is gonna tell me how to use all of these things. There's also a cloth in here. I did a full unboxing video of the kit and everything that's in it on a previous video, so make sure you check the links below to find more about that. The other things that Lucas told me we needed are a small stainless steel pot, two to three jars, glass jars, vinegar, water, and he said wine was optional, but really, is wine ever optional? So we have this too. <laughs> so these are all of our ingredients. I think I'm all set up here, Lucas. But now tell me what to do with all of these ingredients. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to take a cup of water, three quarters of a cup of vinegar, and three quarters of a cup of red wine and mix them together. It would be nice if they would all fit in a pint jar. He's, he's capitalizing on, on my memory there. I love the faith that you put in me for being able to remember what you just said. So how, okay, I got water. I'm opening the water. All right. So start with a cup of water. All right, cup of water. Okay. And pour that into the pot. We'll just use the pot as a holding container for now. We'll dump half of it out. Into the pot. Okay. And then three quarters of a cup of vinegar. It's gonna be fun when we get to the wine because I just realized I haven't opened that yet. Okay, three quarters of a cup. I hope I have three. Oh, just enough. Okay, all right, got that. Do I put it back to the water? water? Yeah. Okay. Add that to the water. Okay. And you need three quarters of a cup of wine. Okay. Um, I recommend tasting the wine to make sure it is in fact wine. Okay. While yeah. Making I, mean, yeah. I mean, we want to be scientific and everything. Yeah, because I mean, sometimes they substitute grape juice and that could ruin the whole batch. Okay. Well, we wouldn't want to ruin it. Let's see, my opener is over here. I, you should have seen me in the store trying to find an English brand of, of wine. Unfortunately, where I went, they didn't have historically accurate English wines for me to throw yeah. into this mix, but but if you can find historically accurate wine or a nice Malmsey, 
That would probably if you make me. your own wine, the stuff that kind of goes sour on you and really tastes terrible is perfect for eating. Awesome. Okay. So see, you can't mess up winemaking. It has a purpose. Nope. All right. So how much wine? Three quarters of a cup. Three quarters of a cup. Three quarters of a cup, and you can pour yourself a glass if you prefer. And all right, do I put that in here too? Add that to the mix. Yep. Okay. That's really pretty. It's starting to look like ink now. Okay. So you should have what about two and a half cups there. Um, what you're gonna do is pour about one cup of that liquid out of that pot um, back into your measuring cup, and we're gonna hold on to that um, for some other steps. All right, so let's see how dexterous I am about this. Half of it, you said? About uh, about a cup of it. Okay. Make sure. Don't spill. All right, I did that. So I'm gonna put the cup here and this back on the stove. Yep. All now, right. add your oat galls to the pot. All right, now oat galls is one of these little, now do I put the whole packet? The whole packet, yep. And I don't have to be, you know, like slowly or anything, just dump it in there? Throw it in. Do, yep. I, do I need to wear the gloves yet? Is it gonna do anything when I Not yet. It? Okay. Not yet. Do I use the spoon? Doesn't matter, you can. I was so excited to unwrap this spoon because it's so cool looking. All right. We used to send plastic spoons, and then I found the wooden spoons, and I was like, oh man, this yes. is what we're doing from now on. They're fantastic. Okay, so, all right, it is dumped in. Bring that to a boil, and we're going to boil it for about five minutes. I guess I should ask if it's okay to smell it first before I just do that. So, as long as you don't eat the ferrous sulfate, everything else, the worst it could do is give you a stomachache. Okay. Um, but smelling all of it is totally fine. Actually, the ferrous sulfate has the clove oil in it, so it smells great. Uh, um, so I saw that when I <laughs> opened it, I saw it had three drops of clove oil. What does the clove oil do for things? Clove oil is a preservative. It's actually antibacterial, anti-mold agent that gets used tremendously throughout history. Now, I know that the whole concept of bacteria and understanding molds and things was kind of the whole field of science was a little bit iffy for Shakespeare's lifetime. Did they know about bacteria? They knew about that if you add clove oil to things, it acts as a preservative. It doesn't go foul, it doesn't get moldy. Okay, so that's not something you added after the fact to keep it no, safe. No, absolutely not. Okay. Yeah. There are actually some rec some excellent recipes that call for clove oil, some that don't. There's actually one I'm working on from the Trist papers from Thomas Jefferson um, that actually have call for it a few drops of essential oil to preserve it and to prevent moldiness. Okay, so would they have used clove specifically or were there other kinds of essential oils that they knew? There are other made? essential oils that work as well. So oregano oil would have one, been one that's native to Europe, particularly native to Italy and okay. areas around uh, the Mediterranean. So it works really well. There are actually more extant examples that call for clove oil that was imported or call for throwing in cloves and boiling the cloves with it. Okay, now I'm gonna smell this. It is okay to yeah. smell it, okay. Yes. Oh, cool, it smells like Christmas with rocks. It smells, yeah, it smells like <laughs> cloves and then like there's that hint of blood that you should get from the iron salt. Yeah, it is, it's a creepy yeah. smell. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, how did they go about getting the oak galls? Like you sent it to us in this nice, very helpful package where it's just ready to go and I don't have to think about even how much 40 grams is, but how many oak galls would it take to make this little pouch? It's about five, it depends on the size. They vary wildly in size from about, you can get them as large as maybe an inch across, inch and a quarter across, all the way down to pea size. Um, and even from some of the same trees, you'll get this, this wide range of sizes, but it's probably 40 grams is probably about eight to 10. Okay. Now, Lucas is the, our latest guest on that Shakespeare Life podcast, and he goes into great detail about what happens to an oak tree to create these galls 
and the, the wasp, and we've got pictures and details about that. So definitely go check out the podcast episode. It's episode 164 of That Shakespeare Life, and we'll put a link to that in the show notes today as well. Where did you get your oak galls, Lucas? Do you? So I buy my oak galls imported from Turkey, from the Aleppo region in Turkey. Okay, and that's um, why I it says... used to get them from a German company um, called Kramer Pigments that sells lots and lots of historic um, dyes and pigments and paints and painting materials, particularly for people who do um, art and furniture restoration. Okay. Um, so they tend to cater to that market. Um, I have since actually got in contact with someone who has a family and their family grow Aleppo oaks and produce galls. And so I'm actually getting them direct from the family who grows them now. That's fantastic. Yeah. So do, would, would Shakespeare have used, he, he'd have gone to an apothecary and purchased them. Tell us about sourcing the oak galls in the 16th century. Would he have gone to an apothecary shop and just bought a bag of oak galls or would he have gone out to trees and found them? So he could have done either, but the galls that he purchased that were imported from Turkey were a higher quality and actually in Shakespeare's time were known to be a higher quality and to produce better ink. And so more than likely, um, really nice, good black colors come from Aleppo Gauls. And so they would have come from the Mediterranean region and been imported up to England. Now this powder you gave me is a very, we're, we're coming, it's, it's coming to a boil over there, but not, not quite. You want it at a rolling boil or like a simmer? So you want it to boil really well, but be careful because the oak galls stabilize the foam. And what that means is it can boil over readily. Ah, um, okay, so stand with it. Don't, don't walk away. Got it. Yeah. Now, the, um, oh, the oh. whole house will smell kind of this musky, earthy sort of smell um, the whole oh. time you're making ink because that's what the oat galls smell like. My husband's going to love that. Yeah. I mean, it dissipates after a while. Okay, okay. Well, cool. Now, the oat gall powder, though, is light brown, and you said that it's the oat galls that makes the ink look black. Why? Is it is. So it's, the oak galls contain uh, tannic and gallotannic acid. Um, and what that does is it creates a complex, a chemical complex in a one-to-one -one ratio with the iron. So the iron sulfate, the iron um, ion specifically combines with the tan and the gallotannic acid in the oak galls to form a black pigment. Okay. So what you're gonna see is we're gonna boil out, we're gonna boil the, oak galls, we're going to extract the tannins from them, you'll filter it, that's actually what the cloth is for, um, and so we'll filter that, we'll get kind of a tan liquid. Um, okay. So tannins are used for tanning things, so historically they're used for, they're called tannins, because they're the stuff that tans leather and tans hide. Okay. Okay. Um, and it, it does the same thing, it reacts with the skin and helps to preserve it, well these tannins will also react with iron to form a boil. All right, pig. I have a boil going over here. Look at what I. Do. So we need to boil it for about five minutes. Okay. So turn it down to low, just at the boiling point is good. Um, the reason to boil it, and you'll see some recipes that just give you ratios, and they tell you to add this much water and this much gall and this much because of that. Boiling it. Um, like really good. Do I need to like move it if it starts boiling too much? If it boils too much, pick it up. Yeah. Just turn it to low. Okay, I did adjust it to low, but it's starting to foam pretty well. As you said, it would. Hmm? Yep. Hope that means I'm doing it right. <laughs> it's actually really weird. So it's the lignans that are in the oak galls that destabilize the foam. Well, the lignans and the polysaccharides, those actually hydrolyze pretty quickly and they break down. So once you've boiled it for a while, they no longer stabilize the foam, but we're not really going to get to that point. That's what I do like a day of boiling. Yes, you can tell that Lucas is professionally a chemist and knows all about exactly how this works, which makes me feel a whole lot safer about this entire process. <laughs> Not something I would want to have tried without helpful instruction, so thank you very much. We got about three minutes left for it to boil. It looks like it's calmed down now. The foam is not so much of a thing. Yeah, it, it, it starts calming down pretty quickly with the oak galls. Okay. Um, there's a couple of things that I've made ink from, sumac leaves in particular. Uh, um, they have so much, so many polysaccharides, so basically sugars and starches 
that are in those leaves that it never stops foaming. Like it wow. never stops. And so it's like this really low boil and watch it. And I've, every time I've done it, I boil it over and I make this huge mess everywhere. <laughs> and it smells like burnt sumac juice oh, no. all over the house. It, yeah, no, it's always a mess. It's like you're, it's like you're burning leaves in the backyard. Yeah. Okay. Now it's, yeah, it's, it's still boiling, but it's calmed down quite, quite a lot. Is the being on low temperature, it's cooling off and that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the reason we boil it is because the tannins and the galatanic acid, they don't dissolve very well in water until you get to the boiling point. Okay. And then once you get to right, it's actually just under the boiling point of water. They start to extract out and dissolve into the water. Uh, and so there's actually a number of recipes that they don't tell you to heat it up or to boil the galls. And then there are some recipes that call for setting it at a rolling boil. And I've actually, there was someone that I was helping and they're like, why isn't my iron gall ink black? And they're like, I followed this recipe that said to leave it for like two weeks. I was like, you need to boil it first. And they're like, no, it doesn't say to do that. I said, okay, but they just left that part out. Yeah. Um, and you can replace time with temperature, but with actually extracting tannins, it doesn't work very well. And okay. so it's better to just, just bring that up to a boil makes a huge difference so, in how many tannins. This is the same reason why you bring tea up to that same temperature, okay. is because it's actually the tannins and tannin-like compounds in tea that give you the color of tea. Right, so if you want it to be the right color, make sure you boil it first. Now I'm interested to ask you about the vinegar in particular. I know vinegar, I know probably more than I should about vinegar because my son is allergic to corn and we can't use vinegar in what we cook. Would Shakespeare's have used vinegar like, like this, like just cooking vinegar? So most or? likely it would have been wine vinegar. Okay. So it would have been old wine or wine vinegar or something were the most common vinegars. There are cider vinegars from the period okay. uh, made from apples, so old apple cider. Um, anything like that works really well. So when we're making this at home, if we want to try this again, which we definitely will, my son's already asked me, can we do this again? So can we use apple cider vinegar or red wine vinegar interchangeably? All of those will work just fine. Okay. Yeah. Same amount. The recommendation for white okay. vinegar is because the cost of the vinegar doesn't really matter. Okay. <laughs> um, and so white vinegar is the cheapest, the cheapest and it's what people tend to have around for cleaning purposes. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So we've got 30 seconds on the timer and then our five minutes will be up. So what's the next step then now that So it's the next step is to take that cup, that cup of uh, liquid that we've reserved, okay. pour half of it into each of the jars that you have. Okay, so I'm gonna open my jars. That's gonna beep at me in just a second. Let's see. Can I go ahead and turn the oven off? Can I turn the oven yeah, off? Yeah, you can turn the stove off, yeah. So half a cup into one jar. I'll hold this up so you can see what I do. Okay. All right, done. And so add the iron to one. The, the whole packet. The so whole this packet. has yep. iron sulfate with three drops of cloves. I'm just gonna open it up. Make sure you smell that when you open your kit because that's the wildest smell. Okay. All right, done. And Let's... then swirl it to dissolve it. You can stir it with a spoon or you can just kind of swirl it around. Okay, now I stuck the spoon in the pot. Does that matter? That I... Um, then let's not put it in the iron yet. <gasps> Look, it's changing colors. Because there's tannins in the wine. Oh, it's purple now. Yep. Oh, how cool is that? Whoa, it's like magic. Okay, now what? All right, now add the gum arabic to the other jar. Okay, gum. And this is where you'll need your spoon is to mix that into kind of a glorpy paste. Okay, so I, since I stuck the spoon into the pot, can I just use one of my spoons or? You can, or you can use the same spoon. It doesn't matter if it's, okay, yeah. so it won't mess anything up. All right, so this is another packet from the kit and you don't have to measure, just, just dump the whole thing in the jar, yes? Yep. This kit makes doing this so much easier than some of the, we've tried ink making before, but having it all measured is very useful. Okay. Ooh, it's like, 
So I cook with gum Arabic, again, because my son can't have corn, we cook with uh, gum, gum Arabic to replace things like xanthan gum in gluten-free cooking. Yeah. And it's doing what we know it for. That, now, is this edible? It's, I'm not suggesting you eat it. Please hear me, don't eat any of the ingredients it, out of the kit. But isn't it the same it thing? It is you actually an edible grade of gum Arabic. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now, it's not just... Hello. It's not dissolving, it's making like little pellets down in there. It does. Okay. And honestly, the ink may not be completely to the right consistency for a day or two. Um, because okay. those can give you problems dissolving all the way. That counts as stirred, I think. Nothing sticking to the spoon, so okay. Now what? And so go ahead and dump the iron. The one with the iron, dump it in with the gum arabic. All right. Just all of it? All of it. All right. Now I have the worst looking milkshake ever. Okay. Horrible looking milkshake. <laughs> now what? Um, now go ahead and rinse out the jar for your, um, that had the iron in it. Yep. Okay. Goodbye, cool magic purple. Okay. When do and I open? Gonna... When do I put the gloves on? I'm feeling like I'm inching towards ink and I don't want to get my hands stained. Yep. I should have had you put the gloves on before you handled the iron. Okay. It doesn't really matter. As long as you don't cover your entire torso and arms in iron gall ink, you should be okay. That should be good? Okay. That is the only point when I've actually caused myself issue. It hadn't occurred to me to bathe in the iron gall ink, but I do appreciate the warning. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be sure and not do that. I usually make about it, between two and four gallons of ink at a time when I'm making it. So, note to self, when you're doing this at home, put the gloves on first. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. now I'm ready. You said I, I rinsed out the jar. Which is funny because my photo instructions that I have on the website, um, I forget to put the gloves on until about this point. And so, like, <laughs> the pictures that I posted and took were like, hey, don't be like me. Put your gloves yeah, on. Yeah, I'm going to be putting um, a little disclaimer on our yeah. video, too. Make sure. Do this first. Okay. Yep. All right, so now what you're going to do is you're going to take that blue claw. Okay. Grab it in the middle. Okay. And kind of make a funnel. And stick that funnel into your jar. If you were raised in the South where your mother made you fold cloth napkins at Christmas time to put those little rings on it, I just want you to know this is the exact same motion. You just grab it in the middle and shake it, and it makes a cone if you're... If exactly. you're doing Christmas time, you put a ring on it. If you're making ink, you stick it in a jar. <laughs> okay. Now open that up so that you have a little pocket in there. Okay. And then what you're going to do is take and dump your oat gall solution into that. Um, the one in the jar. The oat gall solution. Is so on the, the one stove. from the stove. Okay. Yep. Be careful at this point because it is definitely possible to burn the snot out of your hand. Don't touch the liquid, just pour. Oh, it's all gonna fit, yay! Okay, excellent, put that. Is there, um, will it cause anything bad to happen if I run water in the pot now that I've done that? Okay. Nope. That should make washing that easier to do. <laughs> Okay. And so now you'll want to kind of pull up and let it filter out the liquid. Okay. If you've ever made your own cheese or your own I have. almond milk, this is very similar. Very similar. I haven't done it from almond milk. I've done it from goat's milk and cow's milk. Oh, that's good. I haven't made almond milk cheese, but I've made homemade almond milk and you have to cheese squeeze the um, almond pulp through cheesecloth to make the milk. Oh, pulp. yeah. So it's... That makes sense. This is hot! Yeah, no, it's it's hot. Use <laughs> the spoon. Actually, a, a metal spoon works better to press it. Okay. Metal but spoon. you don't have to recover all of it. Okay. Oh, that was At this idea. point, my wife always looks at me and says, why don't you just wait for it to cool off? It's kind of running through my mind, I gotta say. But because yeah. viscosity decreases as temperature increases, so it's going to filter better if it's still hot. 
I figured there was a reason. Okay. All right. It doesn't really matter. It'll filter fine anyway, but there you go. I like, I, okay. I have done, and the spoon, the spoon did help. So, okay. Yep. Now, now do I combine? Put them together. Does it matter which, which way, which jar? It doesn't. My jar is steaming. Okay. Uh, ooh, it's not all going to fit. It will all fit. You are right! Okay, right all to the top. Because you boil off just enough liquid and you leave behind just enough in the oat galls that it usually works out. Look at that, okay. All right. And so stir it? a little bit more. Okay. Uh, make, let all of your uh, gum arabic dissolve all the way. Um, and you're ready to write. And it is, I will say, it is starting to dissolve more, I guess, from the heat of... The heat helps a lot, yeah. It is mixing in there really well. And it's got this just rich, really dark purple color. That's so cool. All right, do you have a sheet of paper? Oh, I can find one. Let's see. Okay. I'll use this. Yep, so this is the most fun part. So take your spoon, pull it out. Okay. Let most of the ink drip off, and then swipe it on your paper, and it should go down kind of red. Now watch it change colors. Huh. So as it, as it dries, and as it sits and oxidizes... It gets so darker. It darkens to a pitch black. Wow. Can you date documents by how dark the ink is? You can't. That reaction stops at about three to five, three to seven days. Okay, so it darkens. Yeah, so it gets as dark as it's going to get from three to seven days. Okay. Um, and then over the course, like after about 100, 200 years, they start to go brown sometimes, or you'll get some ghosting. And that has to do with the humidity and the environment and how many times they were opened and what they were exposed to. So it's really hard to date them based on uh, ink degradation and ink progress. Um, tends to be dated more by what the handwriting looks like. <clears throat> oh, I'm having fun. I'm writing Shakespeare now. Do they use it right after it's made like this? Or does it, you had mentioned another recipe recommended letting it sit. So there are some that say to let it sit and to let it mold. Um, the ink that I make, um, in between what we did, I actually seed it with mold spores and leave it for a month for the oat galls to rot and get moldy. Okay. And what that does is it converts the tannins or the tannic acid to gallic acid, which produces a better black. And so I pre-ferment all of my oat galls before I ever turn them into ink um, so that they can be written with fairly readily. Honestly, this using Aleppo galls, you can write with it right away. It is going to progress and get kind of a bluer, richer black as you let it age for about a month. Um, but honestly, it works just fine as soon as you're done. So now we mentioned that the iron gall ink is, is poisonous, so don't drink it or ingest it. But as far as keeping it on the counter or like to use over time, how long? I'm going to put the lid on it here and then... I have this jar now of completed iron gall ink. What, how long can I keep this and use it for? So I have batches of ink that are eight years old, 10 years old, that still function just fine. That's amazing. So this will sit, Susan, it doesn't have to be refrigerated, just sits on the as shelf. As long as you don't, if you leave it open, it'll evaporate and then you have to reconstitute it with vinegar. Okay. But as long as you cap it whenever you're not using it or transferring it to another container, you're fine. Excellent. Oh, so as wow. far as you're concerned, you probably now have a lifetime supply of ink. It turned black. I'm looking down at what I wrote a second ago. It turned yeah. it was it turned black. That's amazing. So wow, that's great. And so that's the difference between buying the do-it-yourself kit and buying uh, scrap workshop cells. 16th century bottles of ink that's just ready to use. And that's the difference is the fermentation that happens at the yep. beginning. That's excellent. As far as cleanup goes, <laughs> just wash everything really well. Okay. And then tomorrow you're going to find gray spots on your counter that you swear you washed and scrubbed once already. 
Just wash them again. And if you have to hit them with peroxide. I will, and actually I didn't ask you this question, but the pot that I made this in, is that now forever an ink making pot? Or, nope. Okay. Nope. As long as you, so if you use stainless steel, as long as you wash it out, scrub it out, um, you're fine. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, I use our big like soup pot a lot of times. Um, but, and I just scrub it and clean. When I say I, I mean, my wife scrubs it and cleans it real well because she doesn't trust that I'm good enough at that, which I don't blame her. Yeah. Um, so, but no, it's actually because all that's left is a minuscule trace of iron. And most of us are actually iron deficient in our diets anyway. It doesn't hurt. Ferrous sulfate is what's in iron pills. So cheap iron pills you can buy from the drugstore um, for anemia are actually just ferrous sulfate. Okay. So overdoing it is bad. A little bit that you might get. not A little bit's fine and probably good for most of us, but too much of it is bad. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lucas, for being here and walking us through how to use the DIY Iron Ball ink making kit from Scrabble Workshop. You can purchase this kit off of that Shakespeare Life website, and you can hear Lucas tell you the history behind all of this in our latest podcast episode. So find that at links below this video. Thank you for being here. I'm Cassidy Cash, and I hope you learned something new about the bar. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. This activity is actually part of a brand new activity kit we're adding to that Shakespeare Life membership area. If you're already a member, you'll see this appear under the activity kits section of the members area. And it comes with the tutorial that you saw us film today, along with the full lesson pack. So that will include some printable calligraphy sheets you can use for after you've made your iron gold ink, you can print out some Shakespeare quotes and practice writing just like Shakespeare in your newly made 16th century iron gold ink. So you can find the activity kit and sign up to be a member with us at cassidycash.com slash join the club. That's cassidycash.com slash join dash the dash club. And you'll find members get a 20% discount on the DIY kit. So if you want to buy the physical kit of, in, of supplies from Scribal Workshop, you can get that on that Shakespeare Life website at 20% off just for being one of our members. So find out more about that at the link below. Excited to see more? Subscribe today at castycash.com slash experience to watch this entire interview, bonus archaeological footage and documentaries and more all about the life of William Shakespeare. I'll see you inside.